Thank you. It's good to be with you. I want to give a shout out to the men of Carlson 2 East, where my son is a student here. There he is right there, Gatlin Briggs, freshman this year. I was just at a, uh, uh, another university where the Dean of Students was giving a reminder. Christian College Dean of Students was giving a reminder about the separation policy between men's and women's dorms. I, I imagine this will uh, sound familiar. So he was reminding them, listen... No men on the women's side, no women on the men's side. First infraction, $20. Second infraction, $60. Third infraction, $200. Frustrated male stands up right over here, says, just tell me how much for the season pass. (laughs) I like to give stuff away, so... I tried. I tried. It's a little book called Long Hairs Rising. It's about God's call to a new generation of Nazarites to give everything for the sake of the love that God has for humans and to break through in history and to be the change that you are looking to everyone else to be. Be that yourself. Wild ones who die for love. I thought about talking about that, but I want to talk about some other stuff that I think is actually much more appropriate even to the solemnity and sobriety of the story that was just shared today. Psalm 139, I'm going to get to that in a minute, Psalm 56, says, you've taken into account all of my wanderings. And another translation says, you've taken into account all of my sorrows. It's quite moved to hear this story about this young man, Josh. Uh, I lost my wife uh, many years ago after almost 16 years of marriage. I was left as a young father, 36 years old, with four boys under the age of 11. And I met and remarried a widow. I'm going to get to that in just a minute because it all intersects. It's part of this message today about the story of your life and the story that God is revealing through your life. Met and married a widow who had also lost her husband. She had four kids. I had four kids. We now have eight kids. It's glorious. I'm indoctrinating all my kids to give me five grandkids each because this is my global takeover plan. (laughs) Yesterday I was getting a coffee and talking to Amanda and Ashlyn right out here in the little coffee uh, stop. I said, tell me something that has changed your life while you're here. One's a senior, one's a sophomore, if I remember right. Said, tell me something that a professor has said or done, uh, a a moment, an exchange that changed your life. Ashlyn said, it was in Dr. Zagorski's class, and he talked about the power of our individual testimony. I thought that was very fitting, that the thing that can most impact us when we have the right perspective, God is always first, but he actually really enjoys it when we see our part in his story. He really, he designed us that way. There's, there's basic longings in the human spirit that he put there and we should not repent of. And sometimes as Christians, we spend too much time repenting of fundamental design that he delights in. Things like, I want to have significance. I want to have meaning. I want to have influence. I want to have impact. I want to know beauty. I want to have relationship. These are all things that have corrupted and unfortunate applications and outcomes, but the fundamental desire is from God. I'm looking at a room full of people ranging from freshmen to seniors who have a story in God and desires to have impact, significance, meaning, relationship, uh, uh, all, all these things. And I just want to tell you at the outset, I bless that. It's good. God blesses it. And, and your life is about discovering how to tether that to his ultimate purpose so that there is no downside to the revelation of his story in you. Psalm 40. This is going to be my signature verse here. 
It says, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. Listen to every phrase. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. But you have given me an open ear. Burn offering, sin offering, you don't actually require. Then I said, the, 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 the progression's important. Then I said, behold, I come. I delight to do your will, O God. In the book, in the scroll of your book, it is written of me, I delight to do your will. See, so much of Christianity and Christian discipleship, unfortunately, for all the right reasons and for sincere intents, discipleship has, been, has become about what you do or don't do. And you are measured as a disciple based on the burnt offerings and sin offerings and sacrifice and the, the, all that stuff. And, and listen, there really are rules to life. There's, there, there, that, that's a part of reality. But there is, when we perceive that that is God's ultimate intention is to create great little rule followers, it squelches so much of the immensity of who He is in desiring relationship. And out of relationship, you will follow all the rules, but you'll get way more done. A lover will always outwork a worker. So, David has a revelation here. He says, in sacrifice and offering, that's not really what you delight in. That's not really what you delight in. In fact, I've got an open ear now. I'm starting to hear things differently and see things differently. It's not that you require those things. It's that in, in, in understanding who you really are, now all of me can enter into that. Behold, I come. Because I'm starting to see my place in the story. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me, I actually delight to do your will. So the first part is about the requirement. Then there's this moment of revelation where the ear is opened and relationship is seen and God has a story for us that he's invested in and we can invest our own life in. And out of that transaction, something happens in the emotional chemistry of our heart that changes to voluntary love, voluntary delight, voluntary obedience. It's not about what we can give God. It's about what He's already given us. And, and the overflow of that is a life well spent in pleasing Him and delighting Him. You guys permitted to say amen here? I'm just wondering. <laughs> Jesus literally opened a scroll David's, David's speaking poetically, but it's not just poetically, it's prophetically. Jesus literally opened a scroll in Luke 4. He's in his town of Nazareth. He's about to launch his ministry. He takes the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolls it to Isaiah 60 or 61. I don't remember which. Isaiah 60, I think. He unrolls it to the place where it's talking about him in a particular way. It's all talking about him. But it says he found the place, the scroll was given to him, and he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim sight to the blind, liberty to the captives. All these amazing things, liberation, justice, power, salvation, emancipation, glory, healing, this is why the Spirit of the Lord is upon this man. And he's letting them know out of a scroll that was written 700 years before, he rolls that to the place that says, this is the life you are witnessing in front of you. Because he ends it with, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Now I want you to think, we can kind of give Jesus permission on that. Because he was the Son of God. We can give him that space. Gallon man, I love you. I just glanced up there and saw you. Man. I got to get back on track.
Jesus said, today this scripture has been fulfilled. And we give him that permission because he's the son of God, right? He can say or do anything he wants. But I just want you to consider the audacity for his audience. All your sacred scripture, hundreds of years of prophecy describing someone who was going to come that is going to change everything. It's actually everything Israel exists to hope for, believe for, pray for. Everything Israel has been taught to desire, the desire of all nations. Fairest among ten thousands, lily of the valley, bright and morning star. Jesus stands up and says, I'm going to take one of those passages in the scroll of the book and I'm telling you, you're looking at the answer. See, there is a scroll that God has for all of our lives. Jesus was actually just revealing and fulfilling the principle that is meant to trickle down to your life to establish confidence for what you are doing. Scrolls are how stories are told. Before there were books, there were scrolls. That's the point. I'm an author. I tell a lot of stories. I've written nonfiction, fiction, teaching books, uh, fantasy series, uh, medical thrillers, a variety of things. And I love the way the stories unfold because when you're really invested in the story, the, an interesting thing happens. The characters surprise you. See, I'm the sovereign in this. But when I write the book, sometimes their free will catches me by surprise. <laughs> Seriously, I've had major plot shifts in my book that I didn't plan. The characters telling their story. Now... The interesting, oh, I'm going to get off track on this. But the interesting thing about that dynamic is I'm still sovereign and the book still has to end a certain way. So I actually will steer their free will to the conclusion necessary, but the amount of free will that they have even within the process of just typing it out is surprising. God had a dream and wrapped your skin around it. That's what it means to say, my ear you have opened. Because later in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews quotes this same passage out of Psalm 40. He quotes the same passage, but when he says, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but... A body you have prepared for me. And he's saying this about Jesus. He's saying what David said in Psalm 40 was actually messianically meant to speak about the one to come. And so of Jesus, the perspective of Jesus is that the open ear means you've got a prepared body. See, when you start to hear the story of God, your ear is opened and you start to lean in to his sovereign telling in partnership with your free will, you start to realize he had a dream and he wrapped my skin around it. My open ear is precisely the revelation that I exist in the time-space continuum with a physical body meant to reveal who he is uniquely. In my time, for his purpose. And he actually loves the fact that he does it with me and through me. What does it mean to have a body prepared? Let me give you a real visual example. Don't go too visual with this. But you're all old enough. I trust you all know basic anatomy, physiology, and uh, birds and bees kind of stuff. So you probably have a class on it. If not, sign up. Here's a fact, and it's true of every single person in this room. The way God designed it when he said, let us make man in our image, that wasn't just a beginning principle that was concluded with Adam and Eve. It was a principle by which every human is created. And here's two primary aspects to that I want to tell you. Number one, the very act of love children emerge from. Right? So you aren't hatched. You aren't grown under a rock. You aren't put in an incubator. Uh, uh, 
a, a Petri dish. God did not create a sterile clinical uh, uh, human birthing program. He actually created it so that, now there's some, again, some unfortunate uh, ways this happens outside of his intention and plan. But his design, let us make man in our image. And then he creates a man and a woman who are meant to love each other. And out of the natural progression of love, life is inevitable. Out of the natural progression of love, a man and a woman each come together in a unique way. They each contribute something, but love is how you were conceived. Now this says something profound to the human heart if we let this revelation hit us and open our ears. I was conceived in love. My mom and dad loved each other. He had a spark in his eye, and I came out of that. That is a powerful statement of the very beginning and essence of your life. Let me go further. You weren't just conceived in love. You were achieved in victory. The average contribution of the male to this equation, I'm being coy here, but you all can connect the dots. There's an egg and there's sperm. The average contribution of the human male is somewhere between 50 million and up to a billion sperm in each love encounter. Think about that. The average is around 100 million. But it's somewhere between 50 million and almost a billion. What does that mean for you? It means you're only here because you won. No, seriously. You are are sitting in this room because you won. That part of your daddy's spark said, get out of my way, people. I'm taking that thing. You pushed and pulled. You... Swam a little faster. A hundred million competitors. When you say you are one in a million, that's the wrong language. You're one in a hundred million. You're one in a billion. You started life in victory. You were conceived in love and born in victory. And that's God's dream. No matter what's going on in your life, what kind of experiences or pain you've had, that's the dream. He's wrapping skin around love and victory and looking to raise you as an overcomer in this life. The open ear and the prepared body are the same reality for that reason. And part of what we have to do is see when our ears are opened that our body's been prepared. The next step in that is don't be afraid to stick yourself in the story. You can't really have a fully opened ear. You can't really have a fully prepared body unless you seize divine moments in your own life with tenacity, risk, and faith believing this is actually your story. So we give Jesus the 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 free pass because he's the son of God to open the scroll and say this was really about me. But other greats in scripture did it. John the Baptist said that he was a voice crying in the wilderness. That's Isaiah 40. John the Baptist did the same thing Jesus did. He found his name in the scroll and a point in history happened 700 years after the prophecy was given and John says to a bunch of people that scroll has my name on it. Peter did this to the entire uh, birthing of the church in Acts 2. He's quoting Joel 2. This is an end time passage with enormous and universal consequences. But Peter wasn't afraid to realize he was in a moment. And his scroll was being unrolled. And he had to tell people, This is what Joel was talking about because he quotes Joel again. He says, this is that in the last days when tongues of fire are falling out. Pentecost is happening. Wind is blowing. There's all these, and they're speaking in other languages. And Peter says, we're in a moment, people. 
The scroll is unrolled and we're all in it. And I'm telling you that. I'm not going to be afraid to tell you we're in a scroll moment. Paul did the same thing. Passage out of Isaiah 49 that was clearly prophesying about Jesus. That he would be a light to the Gentiles. And Paul in describing his own ministry said he was a light to the Gentiles. See, you have to have your ear opened enough, get a sense of who you are, but then you have to actually apply it with faith and boldness when the culture, uh, uh, even the church, other voices around you are saying, hey, 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 let's dial this down. Let's dial this down. You're getting ahead of yourself. No, I want to see a generation of young people rise up who are so convinced that God is on the move, Aslan is on the move, they're in the story, and your body's been prepared for this. Your body's been prepared for this. Your body's been prepared for this, and there is a scroll with your name on it. Because that moment Josh is in right now, I started here, because part of every story is plot twists. There's always plot twists. So it says the Lord has taken account of our wanderings and other translations translate that sorrows. He knows our sorrows. It says he's put all of our tears in a bottle. As you're thinking about Josh, as you're considering your own life, pray for him. But use this as a window to realize plot twists are going to happen. Your scroll has surprises that are going to delight you, upset you, Concern you, change you. And this is where you also have to own your own story. Because if you blame everything else around you, you actually take yourself out of your story. Now you are assigning to random events, sin, fallen culture. You're saying those things are actually in charge of my story because all my energy is directed at hating, regretting, or being offended at those things that have disrupted the peace and equi equilibrium of my life. Rather than having your ear open to the whole counsel of Scripture, Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. If you love Him and you're called according to His purpose, the dream is still on. You're if, if, if you haven't yet gone home to be with the Lord, the dream is still on. This is a plot twist, but He's going to redeem it. When my wife passed away, I did not know this fiery red-headed woman named Jeannie Ramos from California. But I met her and I fell in love with her and our two families of four became eight. Seven boys, one girl. Do not weep for that girl. She is more than capable. Three of them, uh, the oldest, are now married. I've got my second grandchild on the way. But out of that pain and loss that we both experienced, not knowing each other, the story of God kept continuing. The dream continued. I'm still alive. She's still alive. We both have choices to make. Do we want our story or not? you got to decide, do you want your story? you got to be willing to seize it and stick yourself in it and live it with all of its ups and downs, trusting Romans 8, 28. Because eventually, Jeannie and I met, we fell in love, our families came together, and I discovered that Jeannie was saved in a church pastored by Scott and Karen Hagen in California. So my wife came to the Lord and was baptized in a little converted bowling alley that they led in California and now I'm here talking to you, and I had no idea that was going to happen 20 years ago. You just don't know. But if you will hold in faith and stay invested, your story can zig and zag and go up and down. But before long, you're going to be speaking to people and encouraging them even out of your loss. And I'm telling you, I was born in love. I was born in victory. So are you, and God has a story for us all. I'd like the worship team to come up. I'm going to close with this passage. I encourage you all to get this book, Windows of the Soul by Ken Geyer. 
It's a great book, but I'm going to close with this. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, the magician Gandalf tells the reluctant and unlikely hero Bilbo Baggins, there is more to you than you know. He said this knowing that within the Hobbit's veins coursed blood not only from the sedentary Baggins side of the family, but also from the swashbuckling Took side. We have a similar mingling of blood within us from a lineage that is both human and divine. Within us, the dust of the earth and the breath of heaven are joined in a mysterious union. Only death can separate. But that relationship is often a strained one. For while the body is fitted for terrestrial environment with lungs to breathe air and teeth to chew food and feet to walk on dirt, the soul is extraterrestrial and fitted for heaven. It breathes other air and eats other food and walks other terrain. Most of the time, though, we are burrowed away in our hobbit holes and don't give a thought to our heritage. I don't know how many students are sitting in this room, but there are that many divine dreams being realized. There are that many God thoughts conceived in love, achieved in victory. Don't waste your years. We're going to wrap up here, but the, the freshman that's just starting, you're on the chart to discover more of your story. The senior that's about to graduate, you're about to begin the next chapter in your story. These four years are some of the most transformative, life-changing, life-enlarging years of anyone's life. The fact that you are here is part of God's dream for you. In His sovereignty, He brought you here, but you have a whole lot of free will to figure out what's going on. Don't squander your time. Don't squander His dream. Don't lose yourself in the big story of the scroll of His life. We're going to close. It's 11.35. I know students have to leave. But if you are able to and want to stay, I want to invite those who just want to deal with God on this. A, a fresh surrendering to His plan. Maybe your ear has been a little stubborn and closed. Maybe there's been some painful things that have shut you down. If you want your ear reopened, if you want a fresh consecration of surrendering your life, if you want to just ask Him, God, show me my purpose and your plan. I invite you to come forward and just do business with the Lord. The altars are open. I'm going to close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this student body. Thank you for what you are doing at North Central University. Thank you for the vision of this place and the way it is a hammer and a, and a uh, sculptor's tool to shape the dreams of God into living realities. God, I'm asking for an impartation of faith. I'm asking for chains of smallness to fall off. If you need to go, you can go ahead and go, but I'm just going to close in prayer and leave it open for anyone. God, I'm asking for chains of small thinking, small destiny, small purpose to fall off. Open our ears. Prepare us. Anoint us to enter your story. In Jesus' name.